Welcome, thank you for joining us. In this session, we're going to be covering how to build analytical workloads in highly regulated environments. My name is Ben Snively. I'm a specialist solutions architect at AWS. In this session, we're going to start off by talking about what highly regulated environments are and various industries that fit into that envir these environments. Then we're going to be stepping through what some of those core components are and how those core components really allow you to add the security layers to build your analytic wor workloads in these environments. But first, let's go ahead and just start talking about some of those industries. Many customers might think of financial and healthcare industries when you hear about highly regulated environments. And of course, we have many customers that fit in this space, like FINRA, Fannie Mae, Intuit, that are building analytical workloads in the financial industry. And you also have healthcare customers, such as Grand Rivers and others, that are building very, very complex analytical workloads in these environments. But it spans more verticals than that. You have legal environments, you have government agencies, you have system integrators that are building solutions in these environments. So the, the, the concepts and the, the elements in this uh, presentation really fit across a wide number of industries as you're looking at meeting those security requirements and building these workloads in these regulated environments. So let's first start talking about a particular customer that's doing this today, Grand Rivers. Grand Rivers looked to take their legacy data sets as well as new data sets from various sources and build a data lake on, on the platform. They partnered with Deloitte to be able to get this done, one of our premier partners. And as a good process, they started with security. So they looked across all the different providers. And one of the core reasons they built their data lake on AWS and to be able to drive these insights was because of the trust and security layers that they could have on top of that environments when building the platform. And you can see a nice quote from the VP, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Lee here, uh, that really talks about that process and the trust that uh, that team had within the platform. So what are some of the core components of an analytical workload when people are building these in regulated environments? You know, many folks really start with storage. So of course you have the storage of your data and many customers are using Amazon S3 to be able to store that data. But there's other components that really fit into the analytical space. You have to be able to find and use your data to be able to actually analyze it. So if it, you can't find your data, it's like it doesn't even exist. So catalog and search is very, very important in these solutions. You also have the ability to secure and lock down your data. And we'll talk about what some of those common questions are as we're having this discussion. Of course, you need to be able to provide user access. And these things together really help build the core components of the analytical system. And of course, you have to be able to bring your data in through data ingestion processes and drive your insights through analytics, machine learning, deep learning, and those sorts of technologies. When you're looking at this, you know, there's a lot of different tools that you could use. And one of the core tenets is really loosely coupling these tools. So the way that you bring your data into your platform is disconnected from your the way you analyze your data. There's a couple core things when you're talking about building these solutions in regulated environments. One, start with security and, and design that into the system to begin with. And two, the tools that you're using today are likely gonna be different than the tools you're using a year from now and two years from now. So as you're architecting your secure analytical platform, you really wanna be able to future-proof the solution and decouple these components but fit into the overall architecture. And that's how we really present these options. The way you collect your data is disjoint or loosely coupled from the way you analyze your data. Not only that, we, there's also special tools that are designed for the purpose of being able to do that function. For example, if I'm getting real-time IoT data for healthcare records, the way I collect that real-time information is likely different than the way I might be able to upload X-ray scans and other imagery. So these tools are custom built and integrated well together to be able to do those functions. Let's start with storage. And when we're talking about data storage, oftentimes we're starting with Amazon S3. And the reason I like to talk about this is there's different tiers of storage based on the use case that you have. And this is something you could change dynamically over time as you're building your system. So let's say you're building an analytical system that's bringing in data. It's a write once, read many system and that data is constantly queried across different analytical tools. What you could do is you could store that in standard storage, which is very optimized for that sort of use case. 
But as that data stops being used, because oftentimes your most recent data is accessed the most frequently, what you could do is you could start moving that data across multiple tiers. You could start moving that to infrequent access and other tiers of storage automatically to be able to really optimize your cost and have those tiered storage, but also meet all of your security requirements. A great example is many of these organizations really have to build these solutions so that they have certain data retention policies. Let's say that you have to keep your data for five years, 10 years, 30 years, for many, many more years. What you could do is you can move that data progressively through your different access patterns all the way to a deep archive to be able to then still be able to pull that data if you're ever required to, uh, for whatever reason, uh, based on regulatory requirements. So these are really showing some of the depth of just one of these services. And as you saw all those different slides earlier, or all those different services earlier, the depth of all these services provide these options to be able to, to meet those requirements. So we're talking about data storage. What are some of the common questions that you likely have when it comes to storing your data and meeting these regulatory environments? One common question is, how do I make sure data isn't accidentally deleted? You know, if you're in these industries and data is accidentally deleted, that's a critical issue. That could, that could cause um, you know, major issues within certain organizations. So there's certain control mechanisms that we're going to go through next to be able to protect against that and have defense in depth to be able to stop these things that are happening. How can you ensure data integrity, be able to find your data, and also make sure only the right users are finding the data and the metadata that they're allowed to have? And of course, auditing is a key component of all these different systems. So in order to really talk through this and, and see how this fits in, let's st start stepping through an example. Data should never be deleted. How can you as an organization really enforce and ensure that this happens, or this doesn't happen really? <laughs> um, and to be able to answer that, first let me introduce some of the secure, security control mechanisms to be able to do this. Let me start with IAM. IAM is short for Identity and Access Management. What it allows you to do is define different levels of protection across resources and, and components uh, within the AWS cloud. So you have principles. These principles might be a single sign-on user logged in. It might be a user. It might be a system trying to process data. So a principle might be a, a particular actor. It doesn't have to be a human. It could be your ETL process. And we'll talk about how that fits into analytical systems in a minute. You have actions, and these actions might be allowed or denied. You know, for example, as a user, you might want to say, users are never able to delete this data from this location. And that could be a deny function saying that they could read the data, but they can't do these other actions. And these are very, very fine grained down to the operational level that you could control. The resources themselves, these are different elements that are being protected. Uh, so it could be data in S3. It could be real-time data on a Kinesis stream uh, if you're doing real-time analytics. It could be a queue or other resources within the system. And these resources are fully qualified through an ARN, Amazon resource name. And that allows you to really not only say these set of users could perform these actions on these specific resources um, and really go down to that very fine grained level. And then not only that, what you could do is you could add conditions. You know, for example, only for certain security tags. You know, there's tagging within many of the different components there or other conditions. For example, conditions are used by many customers to be able to say, if I'm kicking off a training job for machine learning, I only want my data scientist to kick off a job as long as encryption is turned on in transit and rests. So you could turn on that, that flag saying, you could kick off these training jobs, but only if these tags are on the resources saying encryption is on. So this really lets you answer many of those questions that we're gonna be stepping through uh, at different levels based on, uh, on these tags. The way this is really represented is through a JSON set of artifacts. And there's many, many different wizards and simulation tools to be able to help you build this. So even though we show JSON here on the left, um, you have different toolings to really be able to verify and test these settings within your environment. But over here, we actually show a couple of examples of a user. Uh, all these are using ARNs for the principle, for the resource. Um, you know, here you can see an action of S3 get object that allows you to get an object out or read data from S3. But if I don't have a specific allow for a put object or inserting data, I would not be able to do that function. And then here's a, a simple example of a string equals if exists. So this is looking for a particular project code saying I can only do this function 
if the AWS resource I'm, I'm doing that upon has that resource function on top of it. So that allows you to set those different levels of protection under the covers. So let's talk about a real example now. How do I protect it so that I, I don't accidentally delete my data? What you could do is, suppose you have a system that's ingesting data. That data ingestion process is collecting data from someplace. It could be your Oracle database, populated data lake. It could be your NoSQL database. It could be some other software as a service or some, some other solution out there. What you could do is the IAM role or the principal that's running for that ingestion job can have very specific permissions to say, you could write data at this particular location, but you can't, you can't delete data. So what that allows it to do is it keeps running um, and then you could write new data to it, but if somebody adds some code in there, um, let's say a developer is testing something out in dev or some other scenario and they try to delete the data, IAM and that policy is gonna enforce it so that data is never deleted from that location. Likewise, let's say you have an analytical system or a machine learning application and it needs to read data, but you don't want it to allow to put new data uh, because you haven't verified that data source or delete data. Here on the slide, what you see is two examples of that. On the right-hand side, we're allowing reading, but not writing and deleting. And on the left-hand side, we allow write, but not deletes. And what this will allow you to do is write the new data into the location, but it's not gonna allow any of those processes to delete the data. Let's talk about a little bit more of a complex example. You know, Many customers want to take their data sets and create different uh, optimized views on that data. So let's say you're building a machine learning application, you want to do feature engineering and create additional features out there or other sorts of uh, aggregated data sets that your analysts or business intelligence users are going to use. What you could do is through those ETL processes, you could set up all these fine-grained mechanisms where in this example, we have an enrichment process that's reading data out of one location and writing data to the new location. And since those are very disjoint or those are separate resources, if that application ever tried to write data front to the ingestion location, it would not be allowed to. It can only write data to its destination. And these fine-grained controls really let you set up those policies to be able to control which entities, which principles could write to the different locations. So, you know, many times you have to have users that have elevated permissions so they could go in and change different permissions for different users. And you want to be able to have a defense in depth strategy to be able to protect against that as well. And there's really two key artifacts or two key components that are really um, combined with IAM policies to be able to help do that. The first is a permission boundary. And the permission boundary really allows you to set up certain conditions that those users um, have to satisfy or have to, to combine with, with whatever IAM policy they have. So let's say you have uh, uh, somebody that has uh, access to give themselves certain actions, but you don't want them to do certain functions. You could define that within the different permission boundaries. And even if they try to elevate their permissions with an IEM, it will protect against this. Not only that, you might have a very big organization and you want to be able to connect uh, or uh, protect uh, additionally across uh, the different organization as well. So what you see on the screen here is a combination of these three artifacts. You have a service control policy, that's what SCP stands for, uh, for the organization that's defining the set of operations. You might have a permission boundary that's also setting set of operations, and then the identity policy where the users are only controlling that bottom uh, circle of the Venn diagram. So this really lets you add that defense in depth and have these different artifacts really controlling those guardrails um, to be able to protect your data and set the security posture that you need. So, of course, you need to be able to um, find your data uh, in addition to protect it. So if you, don't, if you can't find your data, it's like it doesn't exist. Um, you know, there's concepts like data swamps and other uh, things uh, out, out there that, that are kind of part of this concept of um, you know, people trying to build systems but not being able to find and use their data to be able to drive those analytics. So let's talk about that next. And with that, we're going to be talking about this top left circle, the catalog and search components of these analytical workloads. And again, we're going to be talking about it in regulated environments and some of the security considerations that you likely have when you're talking about the metadata and being able to find your data. Because very often, the, the fact that the data exists is something you want to protect as well and only expose to certain users. So you don't want certain, in certain scenarios, you don't want users to be able to even see the metadata, the columns, the fields, the headers, 
uh, of that data set uh, if they're not allowed to see that. So first we're gonna talk about AWS Glue. Um, so Glue provides a data catalog component. It's Hive compliant, uh, so you can use many of the tools that talk, talk to Hive. And it really allows you to store your metadata, your technical metadata catalog, in, in order to describe this information. And you can set up policies, and we'll talk about two ways of doing that. One is through Glue, and the other is through Lake Formation. Within Glue, you could define certain data sets and certain tables, and I should use air quotes when I say tables, because what they really are are logical data sets or data models. Um, that lets you define these uh, data sets to be able to say only certain users could access um, specific data sets that you want them to access. And within Glue, um, you know, when you're talking about security and compliance and these sorts of things, you want to be able to automatically discover your data and also discover when that data set changes. So let's say you have different data providers and you want to know when the metadata, when the fields change, you know, for example, let's say I have an address field and it's a long string that includes the state uh, or country and those sorts of different fields within it. But later on, the data provider changes that to be a nested struct or a nested set of fields. You want to be able to have tools that automatically discover that because that influences your availability and the consumption of that data. And those are some of the features that we see many of these customers using, such as Glue Crawlers to be able to find and discover when that data changes and be able to react to that very, very um, um, uh, quickly to be able to, 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 to fix those situations. And here you could actually see different types of crawlers uh, talking to your different storage uh, providers. So talking to relational databases, talking to NoSQL databases, your data warehouse, maybe your data lake in S3. Um, so the catalog is meant to be able to capture and catalog all that information. And it's all about that future proofing, right? Once you have your data in a consumable form, such as S3 using open standards, and you have a catalog that can talk to all these different tools, you've essentially set up a way to future proof and add new tools uh, that fit into your security layer and try out new things very, very quickly. Uh, for example, you know, if you want to try out machine learning, deep learning, or, or the latest sort of analytics, uh, you know, maybe you're a Spark uh, on you know, Marshop and you want to try Spark on Kubernetes. Uh, those sorts of scenarios make it really easy to try out when you're using open standards and using these tools to be able to do that. And even though you're using fully managed services, they're all standards based. So it allows you to interact with those very, very seamlessly. So how do we set up finer grain access control? I mentioned earlier with Clue, you could actually set up uh, table or data set uh, access. But what if you have certain columns that are protected? You know, maybe you have a social security number or other unique identifiers that you want to only allow certain users or certain groups of users to access in certain situations. And with that, you could end up leveraging services like AWS Lake Formation. It, it has a wide set of features. It has blueprints and all these other things to help automate and speed up your creation of your data lakes. But it also allows you to create these fine-grained control mechanisms. And this is really what I'm going to dive into in this discussion, given it, uh, it's a 30-minute discussion. So with the fine-grained control mechanisms, what you could do is you could not only define at the data set level who could access which data sets, you could also define down to the column level. You know, for example, let's say you have two users, or these could be groups of users as well, and these groups of users need to be able to access the same logical data set or the same data set in your data lake, but they have access to different fields within that data lake. That fine-grained policy allows you to define certain columns, and you could do an include or exclude mechanism saying uh, this set of users could include these five fields, or you could say, you know, I want to exclude just social security number. So you have flexibility of how that gets defined. And, you know, if I was in your shoes, some of the thought process is if I'm adding new columns over time, do I want those to automatically be, be included? Or do I want to be able to have to go in and manually include those for different sets of users? And you really have both options in this scenario. And the way that works under the covers is within Lake Formation, you really have a, a, um, a credential provider that is providing temporary credentials or short-term credentials to the analytical tools. So what happens when that user comes in, they get temporary credentials. They can't access the data directly in your data lake in S3, but instead, uh, using the analytical tools such as EMR, Athena, Glue, um, you know, Redshift, these different analytical tools, what happens is that is automatically enforced so that if they try to create those fields, uh, they won't be able to see them. 
There are some really great deep dives, uh, full sessions on, for example, uh, fine grain access control with Athena and those sorts of things. So if you search for those, you'll, you'll see some really good content and some videos of what that looks like under the covers. And then also, how can you audit the, the use of your data? Who tries to delete your data, both the successful and the attempts that might be performed within your data set, within your uh, analytical workloads? And there uh, is another great example of how we've integrated things like CloudTrail. CloudTrail provides a full audit a log of things that happen within the AWS control plane. But what you could do is you could also integrate that and within lake formation, you have a single pane of glass that provides this audit history for your folks, for your, your data lake administrators and your different users to be able to see what activity is happening within that data lake. And this really lets you go in and see very, very quickly on a, on a pane of glass uh, what's going on with your data system. So let's talk about this a little bit more and data being deleted. Um, so here what we see is the different layers of your analytical workload. And now what we're going to be talking about is how that, that concept might influence your data ingestion process. So here we have over on the bottom left hand side, we have the different ingestion services, uh, things like Kinesis and DataSync and SFTP for, for S3. And you have many different options uh, for this. These, all these options integrate with the different layers we've been talking about. They all integrate with IAM and those policies. Um, you can set up service control policies and the organization um, at the organizational level and permission boundaries. And everything that we've been talking about now is how these different services get their credentials to be able to bring your data into your system. And just for one, one example, we're not going to dive through every layer here and do this uh, in this session, but if you take a look at data ingestion, um, I just wanted to show a real example of picking that right tool for the right job and how that influences those permissions uh, as you're ingesting the data. So you might have data from on-premises or uh, another provider, maybe it's um, in a colo facility, and you want to bring that into AWS. Or you might want to bring in real-time data. Or maybe you have a relational database and you need to capture change data capture, CDC, and get every change in that database um, and brought that into your analytical pipeline. And this is really where picking that right tool for the right job on the bottom left-hand uh, side of that architecture diagram really lets you do this very quickly. And one of the first things I like to talk to customers with when I'm working with them building these solutions is you might have seen many, many services on that slide. You could start small, start with one data set, bring it in, start analyzing it, and then you could bring in your different data sets using the other services. So you don't have to try to boil the ocean. You could start small, uh, prove out the concept, uh, start with a POC or a pilot or build an MVP, and then start adding your other services and layers on top of that uh, to be able to build that system. And that really lets you do that end-to-end -end pipeline, uh, but iterate very, very quickly on it and using that right tool for the right job. Here's a great example, you know, just to talk a little bit more about different data sets. So here you might have transactional data coming in, uh, different uh, forms of applications in SaaS. You might have files and objects that need to get uploaded. Those might be, you know, in the healthcare space, it might be x-ray scans and other big uh, blobs of information. In government, it might be imagery and other types of things. Um, so you have these different types of data sets of transactions, files, events, uh, streaming IoT data. And all these will flow into the data lake uh, using these different services. And when we are talking about earlier of loosely coupling the way you collect your data and the way you analyze your data, what you could then do is use your different BI tools and your analytical tools. And the fact that the data was streaming in through IoT or that it was a full dump from a relational database is decoupled from the way the folks are analyzing your data. So that lets you start bringing in new data sets in. Maybe you have two different uh, providers that uh, provide their data in different um, different formats and different medium, but you want to provide a canonical or logical data set uh, for your BI tools for that. Since that's loosely coupled, you can start doing that and using those right tools for the right jobs, get it into that canonical form, and start driving those insights using those different tools. So what are some other common questions that we see uh, out there? Um, I'm not going to step through every one of these. Um, I want to provide a flavor of, of how many of these questions are done. Uh, but what we are going to talk about is a couple examples here. Um, but just very, very high level, you have the questions about network isolation. You know, we didn't talk a lot about VPCs and how to control your network, but there's a lot of fine grained control you have there. How you authenticate and authorize. What, what level of encryption you have. Who manages the encryption keys. 
who's providing configuration management, auditability. So all these are common questions that we have customers face, and we have a lot of prescriptive guidance of how to actually set these things up um, in, in the different environments. There's some really great talks about um, how to do this for machine learning and analytics and, and these different uh, scenarios. And it's all really driving um, the use of our security services. So, um, you know, again, I, I'm not going to really talk about every one of these, but things like VPCs to be able to create your logically isolated network space. We talked about CloudTrail to be able to provide your audit history. Things like AWS Config, which is really uh, providing a, 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 a change uh, history of your different AWS resources. You can set up things like Config uh, events and uh, rules to do auto remediation. So let's say you have a policy where um, nothing's exposed out to the internet. What you could do is you could set up different policies and even if somebody has permissions to change it, that it is exposed to the internet, you could have it automatically go in there and change it back and notify them or notify um, you know, their manager or whatever scenario you want to do. So really the, the suite of services really allow you to set up those um, environments to be protected at whatever level that you need to be protected at and really drive that, drives those insights. And a common thing that I, I like to, to call out is you could have that security. You could be very, very secure and have those components in your architecture for your analytical workload, but you could still also be very agile and drive those insights quickly and enable your data scientists to spin up resources, your, anal your data engineers to be able to, um, to perform data engineering for your BI users. You could have that speed and security at the same time if, you're, if you look at using the right tool for the right job and set up the right security layers ahead of time. So one last example uh, that I, I want just to kind of touch on, uh, data encryption. And the reason I wanted to talk about this example is we haven't really talked about analytics very much yet. We've talked about data storage, protecting your data, getting your data in. And I wanted to talk very quickly uh, about encrypting your data and how you can uh, enforce your encryption layers uh, when you're analyzing your data. And in this example, I'm going to talk about Amazon EMR. It's really our Hadoop and Spark ecosystem as a service. And what you could do is you could set up these security profiles. And that security profile lets you define where your keys are managed, how you get your authentication, and the different levels of encryption, both at rest and in transit. And that applies both going in and out of the cluster as well as the internode communication of that cluster itself. And through the security policy, you can set up that, um, that, that configuration and then use that across all the clusters that get launched within your organization. So there's a very consistent use of that. So it gets defined um, and then used across all of your Hadoop and Spark clusters. So uh, just kind of wrapping up, um, you know, when we're looking at building these secure uh, workloads, a couple of key things. One, you can start very small, you know, build your security posture, answer your, your key questions of authentication, audibility, uh, but you can start very small, uh, set up your IAM policies to be least privileged and start analyzing your data. And then you start adding your layers. You could add new uh, ingestion sources. You could add new types of analytics. You could add new users. So many times we have customers that start you know, building a data lake and expose that data to their BI users first and then start exposing the data to the data scientists and their uh, data engineers and their different users. So if you kind of uh, define that out and start small, you could do that uh, very, very effectively. Also, loosely coupling those different layers. So ingestion and, and analyzing your data and really asking those questions of how to define your security posture and your policies to be able to enforce whatever regulatory requirements that you have with compliance, with retention, with uh, data deletion, um, and those sorts of things to be able to define that under the covers. So I wanted to thank you for your time. Uh, hopefully this was uh, useful um, and really appreciate, appreciate everyone attending. And please fill out your surveys. Uh, they're very useful. We, all, we read every line of, of, of the comments there. And just want to say thank you again.